Some, something that provisionists do, especially Leighton, uh, Warren, uh, the provisionist perspective, uh, I, I can't remember their names right now, um, but something that these guys do is that they, uh, they appeal to your emotions. Hello everyone, welcome back to The Biblical Layman. My name is Ricardo Escobar. I wanna first and foremost, above all, say thank you so much for taking your time to watch this video. So it's been a couple days, been busy with the holidays and things like that. Um, so, you know, I apologize, I haven't dropped anything, but we are back on the grind. And what better way to start than to continue our response to um, Elena L. However, I wanna say this really, what I'm gonna answer in this video really is beyond Elena. Um, th this question that she poses to those who hold to uh, the doctrine of unconditional election, um, I've heard this by many who are in the provisionist camp. Um, it's a very difficult and tough question and a very emotional question, and you're gonna see that in, in a second. Um, but wh what I find interesting is that a lot of these questions that are uh, that are presented to those who hold to unconditional election, um, it seems that we are the only ones that need to provide an answer for these questions, that these questions only belong and are problematic for those who are in the reform camp. But the reality is, is if you believe in God, if you believe in theism, right, that there is a God, um, these questions are, are for you. They're for anybody who believes in God, any Christian, uh, you know, no matter whether you're reform or you're a provisionist or Arminian or none of those, um, you have to answer some very difficult questions presented, um, by those within the church and by those outside the church, right? God and evil, right? How do, how do those two work? You know, that's a question that even though a lot of provisionists would say, oh, you know, for reform, those who hold to reform theology, they have a problem answering the question of God and evil. Well, I would push back and say, every Christian has a problem <laughs> with that question, right? Everybody who believes in an all-powerful, all-knowing, um, all-present, ever, you know, present everywhere at all times, uh, God. And um, so it's not just, so this whole idea that it's just this one group that holds to these particular doctrines, they have real problems with these questions. Uh, that's a false narrative. Um, we all who hold to uh, theism that there is a God who's all-knowing, all-present, all-powerful, um, you know, we have questions that we uh, must answer, you know, or need to answer uh, to those who ask of us. So, in this, uh, this is going to be my last response to Elena. And again, it, it really is more than Elena. This really is um, for any provisionist who's ever asked this this, this question, um, and who, and for anyone who who has ever had this question and, and struggles, um, you know, with what Elena is going to present to us. Um, so really, it's more than just Elena, but it is, I'm going to play her video and be responding to it. And this will be the last video that I do in response to this. I wanted from the beginning to do three parts because her video is pretty long. And so this is now the third part and this will be the last part. So let me not waste any more time. Let me play the video. Let's go. They are before the foundation of the world. Okay. Let's put on our Calvinist lenses and, and thinking caps. This is, I am a Calvinist. Okay. So let's just take number one. Okay. Elect unto salvation, foreknowledge, predestination, election, God's choice of some unto salvation. You have five kids. Yes. This is an emotional appeal because we have emotions, which God created and gave to us. And okay. I, I wanted to stop there because I wanted to thank Elena for admitting what she is doing. For a long time, I and many of my friends and many who hold to reform theology have constantly uh, told people and shared with people that what a lot of some, something that provisionists do, especially Leighton, uh, Warren, uh, the provisionist perspective. Uh, I, I can't remember their names right now, um, but something that these guys do is that they uh, they appeal to your emotions, just like Elena just said. They appeal to your emotions. They put you at the forefront 
Okay, they put you in the seat and they want to put you in a situation, a very difficult situation. And they want to ask, what would you do? How would you respond? How would you feel? Now, again, these questions are difficult questions. And so, um, you know, you're going to answer them in a very narrow and specific way. And then once you do, once you've come up with an answer, then these individuals, Leighton, Warren, all those in the provisions camp, they will say, okay, now if you feel this way, or if you would act this way towards, you know, your kids, towards, you know, your, your brothers in Christ, towards your family, how much more God, right? How much more is God going to act this way in, you know, in love and in kindness and in goodness, right? So once they get you to see, once they appeal to your emotion, to your judgment, right? To, that you're the judge, you're at the front of the seat. You're the judge. Once you make your judgment, then they go, well, if you would do that for your kids, if you would love your kids this way, if you would, you know, pray for your brother and sister this way, if you would do these nice things, how much more God, right? And so what it's doing is it's going from the lesser you, man, man or woman, to the greater God. And so they're taking your emotions, your judgment, and then multiplying it and adding it to God, if that makes sense. So you'll see here, what she's about to ask. And when she asked the question, you know, you as a parent and you as a human being, uh, you know, you're going to feel certain affections and certain things are going to come to your mind. And so then she's going to want to then say, now, how much more, if you love your kids this much, if you love, you know, uh, your strangers this much, how much more God? And that is very problematic. Uh, number one, because you are not the judge and you are not God. And there are a lot of things in scripture that demonstrate to us that God is transcends uh, the earth, transcends us, and he does things that we cannot do. And he judges righteously and we do not. And he is God. His ways are above our ways. His thoughts are above our, our thoughts and we are not God. And therefore, when they appeal to you, when they appeal to your emotions, um, I don't want to say it's deceptive, but um, it, it's it's not something that should be done. That is not how we do hermeneutics. That's not how we do theology proper, right? The doctrine of God. That's not how we should view um, difficult situations, that we should be the judges. And then from there, go to the greater, which is God. OK, um, so this emotional appeal really is to get you um, away from what Scripture teaches and to get you thinking emotionally, uh, humanistically, as you know, thinking humanistically in, in your in your feelings, in your goodness and your kindness. Um, and, and it's really an appeal about, you know, an appeal to you. It's all about you. And I have a friend. I have a friend who's shown me uh, tweets from Leighton himself who has, you know, it, it, they were having a discussion, a debate. And he said, you know, let's step away from the scriptures for a moment and just tell me what would you do in this situation or or how do you feel in this situation? Right. And so, again, they're, they're appealing to you. OK, because these these difficult doctrines, unconditional election, uh, you know, uh, are your kids elect? Uh, you know, God and evil. These are difficult things for us humans to comprehend. You know, we're, we're meddling in areas that, that, um, are hard to swallow, are hard to comprehend in our limited mind. We don't know God's purposes. We don't know, um, all that he has planned and what he's bringing about. And when we try to put ourselves in that place that, that you know, that we, that, that we know better than God or, or that, that we can love more than God, um, you know, or any of these things that the provision has tried to appeal to, uh, it becomes very, very problematic. So I want to thank Elena for doing that because that's something that I have constantly spoken out against that the provision is appeal to the emotions. And that's why so many have fallen into that, uh, fallen into that camp and, 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 you know, have slowly been deviating from what I believe uh, you know, the scriptures teach because it goes into, yeah, I, I, I don't think like that. I couldn't do that. I couldn't love like that. I couldn't send someone to hell. I couldn't, you know, choose some, not others. I couldn't. And then it becomes so much focus on I, 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 and me. 
And then we think, well, God is much more loving than me, so there's no way he could. There's no way that he could do this. There's no way that he could do that. There's no way that, you know, and then we begin to attach these things to God that really come from us humans and and things go south. Things go really south. And that's why a lot of it, those in the provincialist camp um, are, are going south because what was supposed to be soteriology, meaning what was supposed to be uh, doctrine of salvation, uh, has now gone into theology proper, the doctrine of God. And now, uh, you know, there are open theists in the provisionist camp. Uh, there's like one or two universalists. Um, there are those who have given into, um, who believe that, that God changes, that God is changeable and, um, and that he repents like you and I. And I mean, it's gone south and it's because what was supposed to be conversations about salvation have now become conversations about God, about church, about salvation. And, um, yeah, they've met a, they've made a, a huge muddle, you know, they've made a huge muddle and a lot of it has to do with this emotional appeal. But I just, so I just wanted to share that. So let's keep going. You have five children. You have no idea which ones are elect or not, or if any of them are, but you're still going to, you're still going to share the gospel with them and pray for them their entire life your entire life. Every Calvinist has to face this and consider this and wrestle with this. Okay, so you heard it right there. Every Calvinist has to face this and wrestle with this. No, every Christian has to wrestle and face this, right? But again, the I, I don't want to use the word deceive, but there is such a misrepresentation uh, and, um, I don't know, I may have to use the word deceive, but... Um, there's this idea that only Calvinists, only Reformed theologies have to answer these questions. Like, I, I mean, we all have to answer these questions. I mean, again, we look in the scriptures and what the scriptures say and teach is what we adhere to. Okay. We don't adhere to things be, because it's easy, because we like them, um, you know, because it, 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 you know, it tickles us and it makes us happy. There are things in scriptures that we wrestle with. Okay, there are things in scriptures that are difficult for us to understand, but we are not God. God is God and he knows what he does. And so, no, this is not something that Calvinists have to wrestle with. This is something that everybody has to wrestle with. And what you're, what we'll see in the video, uh, I may play it, is that um, many like Elena, many in those provisionist camp, they don't really defend their view. They don't really present their view. They simply just say, they simply just attack and misrepresent Calvinism and try to get you, the audience, the listeners to get away from there because that's so bad and to fall in line more with them. But again, you don't really know what they believe because in the video, and I'll, I'm gonna, hopefully I'll play it for you, you know, she's going to say how she knows her kids are elect, but it doesn't really answer the question. You know, um, I mean, there are like at least five questions I can return to her and say, well, what do you mean by that? And how would you, you know, answer these questions? So it's not that easy. It's not what she's going to be. Um, the question she's going to be throwing at us is not easy at all. But let me continue. It doesn't matter how many times you share the gospel with them. It doesn't matter how many times you pray for them. If they are not elect, they are utterly doomed and hopeless. That's just the fact. Okay, so notice here. Uh, this is this is very key to understand. Notice how in her mind she's separating election and prayer and sharing the gospel, right? As if prayer and sharing the gospel have no effect on your children or on the unbelievers, right? And again, this is because of what she's been taught through Leighton Flowers and those in provisionism, right? That election is its own thing. And that no matter how hard you try, no matter what you do, it doesn't matter. Even Warren has said this himself. And again, this is hyper Calvinism, this is hyper determinism, fatalism, which is not something that we believe, okay? Yes, has God, does the Bible teach from the foundation of the world that God has his chosen people? Yes. However, the gospel, prayer, uh, studying the word of God, discipleship, discipleship, teaching your children uh, God's command are not different, are not apart from election. Okay. 
election, okay, is God's part. That's what God has done, right? But there's also means, there's also means that he has chosen to accomplish that election, okay? It's not just that God have, has made a decision and now, hey, let's just sit back and not do everything because, you know, God has already elected and done everything and, you know, everything's determined. And so we're just going to sit back here and do nothing. No, that's not what the scriptures teach, okay? And this, and I'm going to play more, but we're going to get into some very dangerous territory. But already she has a, a false misconception of election, right? That uh, she has a false misconception that if God has in fact determined something, if he has elected people or determined something, then nothing else matters. That the means don't matter, that you don't matter, then I don't matter. And that is not what reform theology, those who hold Calvinism teach. And that is not what the scriptures teach. Okay. So we're going to keep going, but already this is very problematic already. And, and mind you, this is from someone who came out of Calvinism and, and, and understands, supposedly understands Calvinism. Yeah, I've never heard anyone say anything like this to just cross their hands and yep, yeah, well, they're like, well, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. What? <laughs> I, I've never heard such a thing, but we're going to keep going. And you are pleading with God for something that he will never do because he's already decided before they even existed that they were not chosen. You will plead with God you will plead with God for something he will never do. How do you know that? How how does she know that? <laughs> Again, this is so crazy for me, guys, because imagine, go to the opposite end of what, you, you know, the silent thing that she's not saying, you know, the thing that she is not saying, go to the opposite end. That in order for anything to matter in the world, the order, in order for salvation to matter, God cannot determine the end from the beginning. He cannot elect people. It all has to depend on you, on your gospel presentation, on your influence, right? Because that would be the extreme other end, which is what she presents in this video. That in order for anything to matter and for, for, uh, for discipleship to matter, for gospel and prayer to matter, God cannot determine the end. God cannot elect. It all is on you. And that's a heavy burden to bear. Imagine that. Imagine that everything lies on you, on your abilities to teach your children, to teach your church, to teach the unbelievers, on your ability to win them. I thought salvation was of the Lord, not salvation of the parents, not salvation is of the parents or of the, of the church. Salvation is of the Lord. And so she's created this false dichotomy where either God has to elect and determine everything, or it has to be unelect, undetermined, and man has to uh, win them by influence, by 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 teaching, by you know um, coercion at times, maybe by prayer, right? But is that what the Bible teaches? Does it all rest on our shoulders? Does it all rest on God's shoulders? What does the Bible teach about this, right? And I would say that the Bible teaches both, both and, that God knows and has his elect. He has his people. The Bible is clear as day that he has his people. But it's also clear that he's chosen the means to call the elect. He's chosen the means of salvation. God could paint his name on the sky. He could call everybody all at once if he wanted to. But he has chosen you and I to go out there and preach the gospel. And there is nothing in our tongue. There is nothing in uh, necessarily our words. There is nothing that we can do to save somebody. That is the Lord's job and the Lord's work. Our job, our job is to be the voice, to be the mouthpiece, to present the gospel. And the Holy Spirit does the work. So yes, our, so yes, the means do matter. Your prayers matter. You're teaching your children. You evangelizing the lost. All of that matters. All of that matters. So what she's saying here is way off. But I want to continue and I want to get to the final point. Is that what you see in scripture? Is that what you walk away from, from the good news of Jesus Christ? That there are some people that have no hope, no capacity 
to hear the good news and believe and be changed by the transforming work of the Holy Spirit. They are abandoned, utterly left alone with no hope whatsoever, no matter how many times they hear the gospel. Okay, can you guys hear the emotional language in there? Left alone, abandoned. Who's left alone and abandoned? Who, who's left alone and abandoned, right? She's, pre, she's, she's presenting people. She's acting like there's people. And, and again, this is, this is, this is, oh my goodness. This is a misrepresentation of what the Bible teaches. There's nobody out there knocking on the door trying to get in and they can't. There's nobody out there alone trying to find God. And God's just like, yeah, no. Yeah, no. There's nobody out there like that. It's actually the opposite. Nobody wants God. They love their sin. And yet God is so gracious. He comes and he calls them to himself. But instead, what we have is we have these poor little people who just are lonely and abandoned. And they, and they want the gospel. They want it. But oh, well, they, they couldn't get it. Is that what the Bible teaches, guys? Like, is this what the Bible teaches? No, it doesn't. Now, listen to this. And this is the last point here. No hope whatsoever, no matter how many times they hear the gospel, which is the power to save anyone who believes, or how many times you pray for them. That is something every Calvinist parent has to face. Some of my children may or may not be elect. Nothing will work. Nothing. Because they are dead to the point where nothing I say matters to them. Okay, you see, you put those because God did not choose them, <laughs> right? And this is this is the emotional appeal. This is this is to get you away from the scriptures, get you into your thoughts and into your feelings, get you thinking about your kids, and and then begin to say maybe maybe that's not the way. But guys, what does the scripture say? Okay, let me tell you something. As somebody who holds to the doctrine of unconditional election, I have never once questioned whether my kids are elect or not. Why? Because I am not God. That is not my role to figure out who is elect, who is not elect. That is not my job. I don't make them elect. And that is the theology that they espouse, that you make yourself the elect. That it, it all depends on you. It is on your shoulders, right? That's their big thing, responsibility. They want responsibility for people who reject the gospel. But when it comes to salvation, oh, no, no, that was all God. That was, that was all God. That wasn't me. That was God. But they're made, you can hear it in her voice, in her words, that, it, that if God has elected and chosen, then you don't matter. Your prayers don't matter. Your gospel. But again, guys, is that true? Let's go to the opposite end. God elected nobody. Doesn't know the end. Doesn't know the end from the beginning. Now it's all on you to figure out the end. It's all on you to make everybody elect. It's all on you to make your kids elect, to teach them and to train them elect. And, and, and hopefully, hopefully they get there. Hopefully they, they land there, right? But that's not what, that's not what, what, what is taught. I never, never have questioned or thought, are my kids elect? Because that is not my job. That is not my job. That is not my place to make them elect. It's not my place to be in fear if they are elect, right? Because that's that seems like a spirit of fear, not of love, okay? God has given me responsibility and told me what to do. To train up my kids in the way they should go. To teach them his word. To pray for them. To share the gospel with them. He has told me that I need to model and be an example for them, right? That's why a, a new year... Not a New Year resolutions, sorry. That's what, that's why one of the things I did when God changed my heart, one of the things that I told myself was that I was going to read my Bible in front of my kids, that they would see their father reading and studying the scriptures because I did not want them growing up in a family that simply just went to church on Sunday, that simply they understood church is important. They understood the scriptures are important, but they never saw daddy pour into the scriptures. They never saw daddy studying the original languages. They never saw daddy pouring and praying and seeking God and desiring God and desiring his kingdom, right? That is my job. I am first and foremost a slave to Christ and I am to pursue him. Then 
in that same in, in that same path that I'm going, that I'm following Christ, I am to bring my children with me and train them up. That is my job. Whether there are elect and salvation, that is the Lord. Because the Lord saves. I don't save my children. The Lord saves them. And I trust in God's faithfulness. And I trust in his word. That he is faithful to those who love him for a thousand generations. And I'm going to do my best to train my kids. I'm going to teach them to love the Lord. I'm going to teach them to love his church and to love his word. I'm going to teach them above all else that this world is going to pass, that nothing in this world will bring fulfillment to them. They will always feel empty, but they will find everything in Jesus Christ. He will be their perfect savior, their per perfect shepherd, their perfect comforter in all times. And I will emphasize the sovereignty of God. I will teach them the doctrine of God, the doctrine of sin, the doctrine of the church, the doctrine of the sacraments. I will make it my duty and my mission to train my kids. And whatever happens in the future, I will leave that to God. And I will trust in him for he is good and he is faithful. And so I do not worry and you should not worry. Your job is to worry about whether you are doing what God has commanded you to do. And we leave the rest to him. There is no fear in love. And God loves us and he loves our children. The future is unknown to us, but it is known to him. And he is good. And he calls his people. And my emotions and involving my emotions and, and my kids into it does not change what the scriptures teach. So mom and dad, this is what I want to say to you. Do not fear the future and do not fear and do not place yourself in God's shoes nor in his seat. The Lord saves his people. Your job is to be faithful to him, to preach his word, to preach the gospel, to raise your kids in the way they should go. And the rest we leave to God because the means do matter because not only has God chosen his elect? Has God determined the end from the beginning? But he's also determined the means. Okay. He's also determined the means. There are way too many scriptures we can look at where God has told somebody, this is what I'm going to do. This is who I'm going to use. And their response was never, okay, well, I'm just going to sit here and do nothing because, you know, you've already decided it. So it means nothing. No. When God told them, this is the end. This is what's going to happen. This is what I'm going to bring out. You know, uh, take a look at Abraham, right? Take a look at Abraham. When God told Abraham, I'm going to give you a son, Isaac. Abraham didn't sit back and go, okay, well, he's going to give me a son. It's just going to happen. I'm just going to sit here. No, right? He went as Genesis, I, I believe it's some, um, I have my Bible here. One second. I believe it's Genesis 15. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, do, 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 do. Genesis 21. Okay, Genesis 21. Took a little bit. I thought it was 15. It says that Abraham knew his wife and she conceived. New there doesn't mean intellectual. It means intimacy. God had promised Abraham a son. And how was he going to bring that son about? Through normal means, intimacy. The means matter. Just because the end has been determined, just because there's an elect, does not mean that the means do not matter. Do not let someone deceive you to think otherwise. For God is sovereign in his election. And we are responsible to teach our children, to teach all those around us God's law and to preach the gospel. So do not fear for your children. Stay the course, train them up in the Lord, and he will be faithful. All right, everyone. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that video. Uh, it was kind of long today, a little bit normal, longer than normal. But if you like it, please hit that like and subscribe button. 
please feel free to um, go through my content. There are this is part three of the video. There's two more parts um, that are probably linked below. Um, and until next time, again, this is the biblical layman. Thank you so much. God bless.